and let us worship the Lord. We begin our worship by reading in Psalm 62. Psalm 62, and we're <clears throat> commencing our reading at verse 5. Verses that speak of the Lord as the source of the only source of hope and confidence and the one who proves to be a true source of confidence for those who trust in him. Psalm 62 and at verse 5, my soul Wait thou with patience upon thy God alone. On him dependeth all my hope and expectation. He only my salvation is. My strong rock is he. He only is my sure defense. I shall not move thee. In God my glory placed is, my salvation sure. In God the rock is of my strength, my refuge, most secure. Ye people, place your confidence in him continually. Before him, pour ye out your heart. God is our refuge high. We come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Help us, O oh Lord, as we come and worship, to echo the words of the psalm that we have just read. My soul, wait thou with patience upon thy God alone. And grant, O oh Lord, that today that would be true of every one of us, that our souls would be waiting upon the Lord alone. For he alone is worthy of that awe and respect and adoration and worship. And he alone is the one who is able to meet the needs of our soul. What good would it do us if we would wait on some other? for all others will prove only a disappointment. Help us, O oh Lord, today to shed all that belongs to this world as we come together in worship and to focus our minds and our hearts On the Most High God. Lead us, we pray, by thy Spirit, so that the Lord will be hallowed, not only outwardly in worship, but inwardly in our very souls, that we will come with humility and not haughtiness. That we will come with open ears and not closed hearts. And that we will come above all else looking to Christ. For he is the center of all that we are and all that we bring. Christ Jesus, who came into this world 
to save sinners. That is the basis of our hope. Not anything in ourselves or anything we might bring, but Christ alone. We praise thy name, O Lord, that that aloneness is sufficient. That there is no need to add anything to it. That those who are in Christ are complete in him. And in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We confess, O Lord, our sins. The sins of the heart and the sins of the outward man. We confess our coldness, our pride, our lack of spirituality, our uh, tendency to fear man and to please man more than we ever fear the Lord and seek to please him. We confess our lack of love, the coldness of our hearts, our lack of faith and trust the weakness of our hope, which should be strong in Christ. We confess our lack of zeal for thy cause and for thy kingdom. We confess that we are not heavenly but worldly minded all too often. Indeed, such is the catalogue of sin that rises before us, that we would conclude that we are utterly undone. And what else would we be but for the work of Christ? What else would we be but for the one whose name is called Jesus? For he shall save his people from their sins. Oh, we give thanks today for his living, his dying, his rising, his continued intercession on behalf of his people. Strengthen them all, O Lord, and make them strong in the law and in the power of his might. Remember those of them who are able to gather outwardly in the means of grace. And those who join us through electronic means. We pray thy blessing, Lord, upon all of them. And may we know wherever we are, at home and unable to get out, or here in the public means in a, in a physical way. May we know thine own blessing. Thou art not limited to buildings made with hands, not limited in the way that we are limited. And we are thankful for that. And we pray, Lord, for any who are seeking thee, whose hearts are drawn to the things of the gospel, but who cannot say with any confidence that they have passed from death to life, and who cannot say that they are the Lord's, but who would like to be able to say it. Help them, O Lord, to see that even in that longing, there is something of an encouragement. And grant, O Lord, that in their hearts, uh, the leaven, although it may seem very insignificant, may grow as leaven does. And grant, O oh Lord, that in their hearts and in the hearts of every one of us, there may be planted faith, though it be but as a grain of mustard seed. We know how it can grow. We pray, Lord, for all who are outside of Christ. Our outward privileges avail us nothing if it is not accompanied by inner reality. Grant, O oh Lord, that we would be born again by the power of God's Spirit, indwelt by that Spirit and sanctified by it, that we would truly be the Lord's you know, with a, a new covenant, a bond to our covenant head, and the old bonds broken, all things being passed away, Behold, I make all things new. 
Grant, Lord, that we would all be able to say, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. And in God's house forevermore, my dwelling place shall be. May goodness and mercy watch over us and lead us all the days of our life. And may we long for these things and follow after the Most High. We may be faint, and many of thy people today are faint. But may they be like Gideon, faint yet pursuing. We give thanks, Lord, for the Lord's day and for public worship. We pray, eternal Lord, that it would not be taken from us. Uh, the signs outwardly are ominous. We pray that thou would overrule and that whatever is taken away, our ability to gather here is not removed again. We pray thy blessing, Lord, upon uh, all the preaching of the word today throughout our island and throughout our land. And remember uh, those who uh, eh, gather with fears and troubles in their hearts and uncertainties in their lives. Meet them, O Lord, in the world. Remember those who are unwell. We pray for a deliverance from the plague that stalks the nations of the world. And grant, Lord, that out of it would come good things spiritual and blessing to many souls. We pray thy blessing, Lord, upon those who govern us, that they would come to see that uh, they can do nothing without the Lord's hand, and that indeed thou would work in their hearts in such a way that there would be a visible change in their public utterances, in their policy statements, and in their whole outlook. We pray for thy kingdom, May it come. May the kingdom of darkness be brought down. And may the work of Satan be diminished and weakened in every form in which it shows itself, whether in aggressive secular humanism or in falsehood and uh, in, in darkness. Grant, O oh Lord, that like, the, that like Dagon it may fall and that it may be seen even by its devotees to be empty and void. Hear us, we pray now. Give us, uh, we pray, the light of thy reconciling countenance, uh, the leading of thy spirit, the covering of blood. That is our hope, the fountain opened for sin and for uncleanness. Oh, that we were all washed there, and that we would find that renewing that is in Christ. Remember, O oh Lord, we pray, uh, those with particular pressing needs, we should not forget them. Those who are gravely ill, those who are facing a uh, death itself, and those who know mourning and sorrow because of bereavement. We pray for them. We pray for the uh, McLeod family that were associated once with this very congregation. Remember them, Lord, in their mourning and in their sorrow. We grant that indeed out of these things may come blessing for them. May we commit to thee all that we leave in thy care, our kith and kin, those who are careless, thoughtless, cold and unconcerned, those who are rebellious and hard-hearted and far off, Grant, O oh Lord, that there may be a melting and a drawing and a winning and a wooing and an overcoming by the power and grace of God that we are able to do above and beyond what we ask of Him. Hear us and be with us and cleanse us from sin and guard us from it. For Jesus' sake, amen. Uh. We're going to read together now in God's Word, in the Old Testament Scriptures and in the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel and chapter 6, 
First Samuel in chapter 6, and we're taking up our reading, you'll remember at that point in the narrative where having captured the ark, the Philistines have come to realize that uh, it is far from being the trophy that they had thought it might prove to be. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 6, reading at verse 1. And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, that would be the priests of Dagon, their principal idol, and the other associated uh, clerics <clears throat> that they would have had. And the diviners say, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. And they said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering. Then you shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all and on your lords. Wherefore you shall make images of your emeralds and the images of your mice that mar the land. And you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Where adventure he will lighten his hand off from you and from off your gods and off your, from off your land. Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts, as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts, when he had wrought wonderfully among them? Did they not let the people go, and they depart? Now therefore make a new cart, and take two milch kind, on which there hath come no yoke, and tie the kind to the cart, and bring their calves home from them. And take the ark of the Lord, and lay it upon the cart, and put the jewels of gold which you return him for a trespass offering in a copper by the side thereof, and send it away that it may go. And see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh. Then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. And the men did so, and took two milch kine, <clears throat> and tied them to the cart, and shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, and the coffer with the mice of gold, and the images of their emeralds. And the kine took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh, and they went along the highway, lowing as they went. And turn not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. And they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. <clears throat> and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, a Beth Shemite, and stood there. And there was a great storm. And they clave the wood of the cart and offered the kind of burnt offering to the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the copper that was with it, put in the jewels of gold ware and put them on the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt sacrifices and sac of burnt offerings <clears throat> and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. When the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord. For Ashdod one, for Gaza one, for Ashkelon one, for Gath one, for Ekron one. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, 
belonging to the five lords, both of fen cities and of country villages, even to the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the war, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua the Bethshemite. And they smote the men of Beth Shem, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord, even he smote of the people fifty thousand and threescore and ten. And the people lamented, because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiriath Yarm, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. And so on we trust the Lord to follow with his own blessing that reading of his own holy inerrant word of well, we turn now to Psalm 63 and we read there at the beginning. <clears throat> Lord, be my God, I'll early seek. My soul doth thirst for thee. My flesh longs in a dry parched land, for in no waters be. That I thy power may behold, in brightness of thy face, as I have seen thee here before, within thy holy place. Since better is thy love than life, my lips thee praise shall give. I in thy name will lift my hands and bless thee while I live. Even as with marrow and with fat, my soul shall build be. Then shall my mouth with joyful lips, sing praises unto thee. May God follow with his blessing our readings of the word, as the word of God lives and abides forever. We unite together. Holy, 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 the Lord God of hosts, the whole earth is filled with his glory. Help us, O Lord, today to remember that holiness. Holiness forever, Lord, thine house becometh well. But give us alongside that sense of awe and wonder. Give us, O Lord, we pray, the desire of the sons. Lord, thee, my God, I'll early see. My soul doth thirst for thee. My flesh longs in a dry parched land, wherein no water be. Oh, how true that is that I thy power may behold and brightness of thy face, as I have seen thee here before within thy holy place. Since better is thy love than life, my lips thee praise shall give. I in thy name will lift my hand and bless thee while I live. Make that our prayer. Make that rise from our hearts as water rises from a flood. And may it fill our mouth so that the world sees and hears. 
something of thy grace. Help us as we come to the word. We have read it. We have not read it as attentively as we should have. Even as we read it, our minds wandered hither and thither. Grant, Lord, that we would be focused. Focused by thy Spirit. Captivated by it. And challenged by it. In the very depths of our being. Hear us. Meet us in grace. And cleanse us from every sin, especially in holy things. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, friends, we seek the light of God's Spirit on His Word. We turn again to that chapter in. First Samuel chapter um, 6 <clears throat> that we read together. First Samuel chapter 6 and reading is now from the beginning of the chapter. And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. And they said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, send it not empty. But in any wise, return him a trespass offering. Then you shall be healed. And it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. And so on down through the passage. Well, we've seen in previous weeks the capturing of the Ark by the Philistine army due uh, to the carelessness and the folly of Israel themselves. They sowed the wind in chapter 4, and very soon they reaped the whirlwind. And then on the last occasion, we saw in chapter 5 that the Philistines were delighted. They were delighted. They had captured the ark and everything had gone by their way of it, according to their own plan. But their delight didn't, didn't last long because, as we saw then, the Philistines who were at first delighted were soon deprived. And they were deprived of two things. They were deprived, first of all, of the pleasure, the pleasure they had in a Dagon and in the worship of Dagon and in all that that involved. That was taken away as the Lord demonstrated to them in very dramatic way the futility and the emptiness of what they were worshipping and trusting in. They were deprived of their pleasure and then secondly they were deprived of their help. And we saw, we couldn't but see something of a parallel between their situation then and our own situation now, the parallels are striking. And here in chapter 6, the narrative is picked up again. The thread is picked up. And it begins by telling us in verse 1 that they kept the ark in the land of the Philistines for seven months. You'd have thought after all that happened that they wouldn't have kept it for seven minutes. But they kept it for seven months because, as it says in verse 6, they were stubborn and stiff-necked, just like the Egyptians before them. Like the Egyptians, yes, and like ourselves. The stubbornness and the stiff-neckedness which characterizes us is only too apparent at times. We know this if we know our own hearts, we know something of that. Even the Lord's people, they know something of how stubborn, how foolishly stubborn and stiff-necked they can be at times. And if it applies to them, it applies only all the more to those who are not yet the Lord's. 
but it applies to us at a, at a far wider level as well. Here we are in the nation, or at least a good part of the nation, is now facing a second lockdown. And yet there is no word of God, no word of God in the midst of it all. You would think after the seven months, and maybe more than we've had, that there would be some sort of response, even at a, a very limited level. But there seems to be practically nothing. The seven months don't seem to have taught us much. In fact, it seems to have taught the Philistines more than it taught us. Because after their seven months, there's definitely a softening. Whether it lasted or not is another matter. But there's definitely a softening. Well, so much for the background to the passage. The chapter divides then into two parts. We have the first part of the chapter concerned with the Philistines and the ark, and then the latter half with Israel and the ark when it's finally returned to them. And I'm going to follow that simple division this morning. And we'll spend most of our time on the first of these two. I want us to look, first of all, at the Philistines and the Ark. We're returning really to that because that has been our focus for these past The Philistines and the Ark, the capture of the Ark, the, the problems that they had in chapter 5 with the Ark. And here we see them again with the Ark of the Covenant. And it's very interesting. It's very instructive. There are three things about the Philistines and the Ark that I want to focus on with you this morning. I want us to notice, first of all, that the Philistines had a sense of uncertainty. They had a sense of uncertainty. What do I mean? Well, I mean simply this. They were not certain, they were not sure if all of this, all that had happened, was the hand and the voice of the Lord. Perhaps, as they say themselves in verse 9, it was just coincidence. It was a chance, as they say at the end of verse 9, that happened to us. They are uncertain. Part of them thinks, yes, this is most definitely the hand and the voice of God. It's so loud, it's so clear, it's unmistakable. But another part of them is clinging maybe to the hope that it wasn't, that it was, as they say themselves, simply a chance that happened to them. They have a sense of uncertainty. And you know, there are, there are lots of people like that. And maybe for all I know, that's the way your own mind is working. They hope despite seeing and feeling in their own hearts and their own circumstances something of God's voice and something of God's work going on, they hope that what they are seeing and what they are hearing and what they are feeling and what they are experiencing is not God's voice and is not God's hand. Because that will bring them to a place where certain response has to be given. And if it can be dismissed as merely something of chance, something of coincidence, just one of these things, then it can be put to one side and forgotten about. But if, on the other hand, it proves to be the hand and the work of God, then that means that certain things have to be taken more seriously. Well, the Philistines were in that position. And they decide to set a test to see once and for all if it was just a chance or whether what had happened could be traced to God's hand. They set a test. 
they put the ark on a cart, a new cart, in fact. They give it that amount of honor. They put the cart on the ark, uh, the ark on the cart, rather. And the cart is going to be led, going to be pulled by two cows. And these two cows are left to go whichever way they wish to. They're not being pulled along by somebody on our own. They are left to go whichever way they wish. And the test is this. If they go straight for Israelite territory, that is a sign that this was of the law. If they merely wander off in some other direction haphazardly, then that will be the end of that. But there's another part to this test. The cows in question have calves. And the calves are not allowed to, uh, to accompany uh, their mother at all. The calves are kept tied up. And the cows are going to have to go without the calf. Now, if you've ever tried to separate a cow and a calf, you'll know all about it. It's almost impossible. The cow, if you attempt to do that, it will become very distressed and it will very quickly become very dangerous. To go between the two is something that you don't do like. So the test that they said is really a double test. And ordinarily, there was no way that the cows would go anywhere. Ordinarily, if you put the cows in this situation, they are going to go running about, they're going to upset the cart, and that will be the end of that. Now, I said a moment ago that there are many people like this, and they, they have this uncertainty in their hearts. Is this the hand? Is this the work, the voice of God? Or is it, as they say, a chance that happened to us? Is there something to this? Is there something to the Word of God? Is there something to the Bible? Is there something to the claims of Christ? Or is it all just empty rhetoric? And sometimes the people that have that uncertainty and have these thoughts, they set tests. They set tests, just as the Israelites, as the Philistines did here, for the law. And the test, it goes something like the test they have. If this happens, or that happens, then I will accept that it is the voice and the hand of God. I will accept that there is something to it all. And maybe they go so far as to say, if this happens or that happens, I will seek the Lord. I will turn to the Lord. I will follow the Lord. Well, what happens here? Verse 12. And the kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh. They don't turn to the left or to the right. They don't even seem to stop until they come into the field at Beth Shemesh. It says there in verse 14, the cart came into the field and stood there. It wasn't even a question of them stopping it and putting a halt to it. It knew when to go, where to go, and when to stop. And what about the calves? What about their reaction to the calves? Yes, they're lowing. It tells us in verse, um, uh, where is it now? Verse 12. And the kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went. That's so natural. They're lowing, they're calling out for their young. They're unable to turn and they're unable to stop. 
It's as if they're being drawn by an invisible hand, as if they're being directed, and they are, of course, by the very hand of God. They wanted a sign, but they've got a sign. They wanted a test, but they've got the test. Now the Lord could have said, of course, to them, how dare you put me to the test? I won't give you any more signs. I've given you signs. All the signs in the previous chapter, the, the falling of Dagon twice, the problems that the Philistines faced in different directions, all of these things were signs. But in his patience and in his grace, he condescends to give them yet more signs. He allows himself, as it were, to be put to the test. He affords them this sign too. Now I was saying a minute ago that there are people, many people, maybe you're among them, and they, they look for signs. They want a sign. And they get their sign. But what happens then? They want another one. And often in his grace, the Lord will condescend to give you that other one. But what's happened since then? Maybe you can look back and there are things in your own life and, and they were so like this. You said if this or that happens, then that is it. That's my answer. What's happened since then? Well, maybe you've forgotten all about the test. You've sort of moved on. That happens, you know. You've sort of moved on. And life has moved on. Now that's not good. If you didn't benefit spiritually from it at all, it has only left you harder and colder and further away than you were even initially. And for every sign we are accountable. And for every blessing we are accountable. Oh, it's not good at all. Even these pagan Philistines, they gave the warning in verse 6 against ignoring the Lord and against hardening their hearts. Remember, they say, what happened to the Egyptians? Maybe you've forgotten all about the test. It's, it's past. Or maybe you're setting more tests. Well, that could go on forever from our point of view, I suppose. The Lord, remember, is under no obligation to keep on entertaining our demands for endless signs. We have a more sure word of prophecy to which we do well if we take regard to it. We have the word of God. Maybe you've reached the end of the road as far as these things are concerned and the Lord is saying to you, you're not going to get any more till you make use of what I've already given you. Are oh, the Philistines, they get their signs. It's, it's so clear. It's, it's unmistakable. But there's no suggestion here that it made any material difference to them at all. 
No suggestion that they, they turned from Dagon. No suggestion that they sought and followed the Lord. All the evidence, sadly, is, is in the opposite direction. The evidence actually is that they heaved a sigh of relief to be rid of the ark. You know, there are people like that. And they heave a sigh of relief to be rid of the, any reminder of the things of God. Anything that speaks to the conscience, anything that challenges deep in the soul, they're glad to get away from it. Well, I hope that's not where we find you today. They had an experience, these Philistines. They had a religious experience. But they weren't converted as a result of it. You can have a religious experience that does not end in true conversion. And it passes. And maybe that's where you are. And maybe... You're struggling with that very thing, and you have a hundred questions about it. I would urge you to seek the Lord now without delay. Whatever has happened in the past is in the past. Don't lean on it. The only thing you can lean on is Christ. Don't lean on any experiences. Experiences will not save you. Don't lean on it. But don't let it become a stumbling block either. Don't let it become a terminus in the road, as it were, that leads you to say, well, I had that experience, but that was then, and I, I can't go anywhere from here. Or don't come to that conclusion at all, because it's wrong. The Philistines and the Ark, our time is moving on. There's a sense of uncertainty, but secondly, there's a sense of fear and respect. We've got to do justice to the passage. There's a sense of fear and respect. There's quite a change, actually, in these Philistines from chapter 4. When they first captured the Ark, they are full of a, a barabado and a full of... A, well, they're utterly devoid. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. They are utterly devoid of any sense of all respect to the Lord. As far as they're concerned, he's a defeated dead. They won, and Dagon's won. And he's nothing to be treated with utter contempt. And they take the ark, as we saw, and they put it in the temple of Dagon. Here in chapter 6, there's a no and a respect here now. The boasting and the bravado appears at least temporarily to have gone. Now this new fear and this new awe and this new respect that they have, they make the new cart and as we'll see in a moment, they send their gifts with it. This is good. As far as it goes. And I'm, I'm underlining that, if you like, as far as it goes. But it never gets beyond that, does it? It never gets beyond a cold, slavish fear and dread. They're frightened of them, this God of Israel. But they don't love him. They don't want him. In fact, they want him as far away as possible. Even if it costs them. It's a sort of terror that they have. And it's far removed, and this is where I want to go with this. It is far removed from the love and the fellowship that the Lord has with his people. 
and that he extends to you in the gospel. He doesn't want you to remain at a distance. He doesn't want you there with cold fear and awe. But never knowing or loving or understanding him. He calls us to come, yes, in order that our sin might be pardoned, but in order also that we might enter our real living relationship with himself. A relationship of love, a relationship of grace, a relationship in which he is compared to the perfect bridegroom and the perfect father. What were we reading in Psalm 63? That I thy power may behold and brightness of thy face. As I have seen thee heretofore. This isn't cold, far off, slavish fear. This is love and closeness and warmth and delight. Since better is thy love than life. My lips thee face shall give. I in thy name will lift my hands and bless thee while I live. Even as with marrow and with fat, my soul shall fill me. Then shall my mouth with joyful lips sing praises unto thee. That's not what we find here. You know, the devils, they have a fear of God. The Bible tells us that they tremble. But we need more than that. We need more than that. And we are freely offered more, far more than that. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? A cold, slavish fear and terror. I will give you rest. You will find rest for your soul. The Philistines on the earth, there's a sense <clears throat> of uncertainty. There's a sense of fear and respect. Thirdly, there's a sense of guilt and wrong. In their own way, they have a sense that they had done wrong. It speaks in verse 3 of a trespass offer. They wouldn't speak of that unless they had a sense of trespass. They have trespassed. They have gone beyond what they should have gone beyond. And they feel it. And so they ask, what will we do? And they come up with a solution. And they make five golden emeralds. We saw last week that that's the tumors sometimes associated with bubonic plague. The sort of tumors you get with that. That's what it means by the emeralds. They make five of them or five images of them in gold and five golden mice. And the mice suggest that plague was there and carried. The mice were overrunning the land, it says in one place, in verse 5, I think. They make these, and they make gold ones. They don't make wooden ones. They don't carve something crudely out of wood and say, oh, that'll do, and we'll throw five of them on the, on the thing. They don't even take silver or some base metal and, and, and make it out of that. No, oh, they said, we'll make gold and we'll make five. One for each of the lords of the Philistines, a, a peace offering, a trespass offering. One for, for, for the people of Gaza, one for the Ekronites, one for the Gathites, and so on. And surely, surely that will do. This will appease him. Our gold. They give poor people that they were, they give the best that they could. The best effort that they could muster. Now again, you know, there are lots of people and they're just like this. They know deep in their hearts that God is offended, that there is a trespass. Things in their past particularly. 
things in the present, particularly things in here, right now. Things that are wrong and the guilt that comes with it. And how can we put that right? How can we make peace? Oh, we'll see what we can make. So they bring the gold of their own efforts and of their own prayers and of their own religious exercises and of their own this, that, and the next thing. And they, they, they bring gold. And they say, well, surely, surely this is going to, this will do the trick, as it were. But the Lord wasn't interested in their golden mice or in our golden efforts. Trespass can only be covered by one thing. We have peace with God, not through the gold of our efforts, but through the gold of Christ and his finished work. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how the trespass is dealt with. That's how the guilt is removed. As he takes the place of the guilty. As he carries the guilt and bears the guilt and makes it his own. And takes it away. That's the gold standard that God accepts. That I might be found in him, says the apostle, or the apostle Paul before he was converted. He was busy with gold, the gold of his own efforts. You can read all about it in his letter to the Philippians. And he thought he really had done very, very well. He gave himself Top marks, gold star. But he came to the point where he saw that all that he had accumulated, all he was putting on the cart, if you like, it was utterly worthless and less than worthless. He counts it as done that he may win Christ and be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is after the law, but that better righteousness, which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness of Christ, imputed to him, given to him, covering him, meeting him in all of his need. And that's what we need for our guilt. That's what we need for our souls. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that removes sin. There is a fountain opened for sin and for uncleanness. And those who are plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. What we need is not amazing efforts, but amazing grace. Amazing grace. The Philistines and the Ark, but very quickly, secondly, Israel and the Ark. Now, I want us to notice in the passing some of the things the Israelites remembered when the Ark came back. They remembered, first of all, the blessing of God's presence. They see the Ark coming and they, they rejoice. They're not cold. They don't shrug their shoulders. They don't say, well, it doesn't matter. We're told in verse 13 that they rejoice to see it. They remembered the blessing of God's presence. As we were reading there in Psalm 63, that I, thy power, eh, may behold and brightness of thy face, as I have seen thee here to fall within thy holiness. There's something of that in that experience here. I, I said in your own experience. Are you remembering today? Are you rejoicing? Even in a little of the presence of God. What a good thing it is. Or does it leave you utterly indifferent whether he's here or not? Does it bother you if he's here or not? They remember the blessing of God's presence. Secondly, they remember the urgency of God's business. They're reaping when the ark arrives, but all of that is left aside. Lord, be my God, I'll early see. 
my soul doth thirst for thee. Everything else is put to one side because something more important is. Is that how you are today? Everything else to one side. The concerns of the soul, the concerns of eternity, these are the great issues. Everything else will have to wait until this is done. All the reaping, put it to one side. Ah, but the weather may change and we may not get the yes and matter. They remember the blessing of God's presence. They remember the urgency of God's business. They remember the rules of God's ark. They get the Levites in verse 15 to 100. They even remember the means of God's approach. They remember that he is to be approached by sacrifice, not golden um, presence. And they offer there at the great stone a sacrifice. They remember the means of God's approach. They get all of that right. But there's a fly in the ointment. Because they forgot the holiness of God's being. They remember lots of things. But they forgot one thing. The holiness of God's being. And in verse 19... In a moment of misplaced curiosity, they look into the ark, something that was totally forbidden, even for the priests, and it led to death and tragedy. How do we explain this? Well, he is not some haughty human tyrant who makes ridiculous rules that we break at our peril. But he is God. He is God. And the Philistines had to learn that. And Israel in verse 19 had to learn that. And we have to learn that too. He is God. He is not to be ignored. He is not to be trifled with. He is not to be treated lightly or taken for granted. He is God. Remember, holy, holy, holy. The Lord God. And angels nail their faces. But all too often, to coin the phrase, fools rush in, where angels quite literally fear to tread. If he has rules, they are there for a reason and they are there to be kept. And yet, and yet, this lofty almighty God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son as a substitute for sin so that the way is opened up for sin to be put right and sin to be pardoned rather being put to Christ's account as he pays the debt of his people. And for sinners, as I was saying earlier, to be reconciled to God, to come into communion and fellowship with this high and holy one. Not the cold fear of the Philistines that never goes beyond a sort of far off distant awe but the loving embrace of a heavenly father who blesses those who receive him. And as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And as for the ark, well, it ends up in the house of Abinadab, and later in the house of Obedida. And we're told that the Lord blessed that home. I think it's F.B. Mayer who comments in that context. The Lord blesses those who receive the ark. And if he blessed those who receive the ark, the literal physical ark here, how much more does he bless those who receive into their homes and into their hearts? 
the one who is symbolized and typified by the ark, the Lord Jesus Christ. With the ark came its covering the mercy seat, which speaks so graphically of Christ. Oh, what a blessing to receive him. What a blessing if today you have come from being far off to having the ark that is Christ inside the door of your home and inside the door of your heart. What a blessing. There is forgiveness with thee, we're going to sing in a moment, that thou mayest be feared. Well, I trust, if that's your case, that as it goes on to say, you wait for the more, Lord, as the watchers for morning. But remember, remember, holy, 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 the Lord God of hosts. May God bless his word. Let us pray. We praise thy name, O Lord, for every reminder of holiness and of highness, and ever a reminder too of grace. Bless thy word and cover anything we said in this. Take it away and blot it out. We've never yet offered a perfect act of worship. It's always been marred. Always been marred. And it always will be this side of eternity. We are thankful that thy people look to a day when their worship will be perfect. Hear us and cover our sin. Watch over us throughout the day. All we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Psalm 130. We'll sing the whole psalm. I shan't read the verses. I quoted a number of them just a moment ago. Psalm 130, the whole psalm, Lord, from the depths. Lord, from the depths to Yeah. Uh -huh. 
fellowship of God the Holy Spirit rest on and abide with you all now and forevermore.